Hello, everyone. This is Dino. So today I'm pretty excited uh, to start uh, some brand new lectures on uh, Rebo exam prep material. Now, uh, these lectures uh, are based on the Insurance Brokers Association of Ontario IBAO textbook. Uh, the title of the book is Becoming an Insurance Broker. And I'm looking at the second edition of 2023. And uh, in order to follow my lectures, uh, you must have this textbook to follow my lectures. There is no question about it. Uh, I know sometimes I get uh, questions on um, on YouTube, you know, should I buy the textbook? Yes, you must buy the textbook so that uh, you can take uh, advantage of the lectures. You will not be lost with the lectures without the textbook, right? So also you can visit um, uh, www.ibao.org and uh, get their phone number and call them and uh, get the textbook. All right, so I'm on page 30 of this book where it starts out with chapter one, uh, interaction. And um, I'm gonna start off with the defining insurance. Okay, I'm just gonna concentrate on the most important stuff. Uh, sometimes, you know, they just, uh, for example, they go um, like six, seven pages of uh, about this book and the index and all of that. I'm just gonna skip all of that, okay? Just for the sake of time. And I'm going to jump right into uh, page 30, which is the beginning of chapter one. And we're going to define insurance, extremely important. We have to get to the bottom of this definition of insurance. And you can see uh, it's kind of a packed sentence, the definition, and I'm going to unpack it. So it says here, in Canada, each province's insurance act defines insurance. And the definition of insurance cannot be so different from province to province. It may be worded a little bit differently, uh, but it's just that the fundamental substance of definition goes like this. Insurance is the undertaking, pause right there. So an undertaking means a company is making a promise to take on something like a car or a home or a business and to insure it. So it is a legal undertaking. It's a legal promise by one person, usually they are referring to the insurance company, to indemnify another person. So the word indemnify, I don't know where we, are. we got stuck with this word indemnify. I don't even know uh, how we, uh, in English, we coined this name. The simple meaning of indemnify means to reimburse to pay for a loss, okay, that's all it means. So insurance is an undertaking with one person, which is the insurance company to indemnify another person who is the customer, who owned the car or a home or a business against loss or liability for loss. Okay, let me give an example of a loss. You had a fire in your home, you had a water damage in your basement, that's a loss. Your car was stolen. That's a loss or liability for loss. So what is the meaning of liability? So the liability is all about you either caused bodily injury to another person or you caused damage to their property. Liability is all about a third party that you have through your negligence caused either property damage or bodily injury and now they're going after you for compensation. So the insurance policy will cover that. When you look at uh, an insurance, a typical insurance policy for a home or car or condo or tenants, whatever it is, you will see the liability portion clearly defined. Not only they're gonna cover you the property, they'll also cover you the liability. Why? Especially here in North America, the society is becoming so litigious, especially in the US, everybody is suing everybody else, <laughs> okay? That's the reality. The lawsuits are, lawsuits are just flying everywhere. So the insurance companies, decades ago, they started adding liability coverage to protect you in a court of law, okay? In respect of a certain risk or peril, 
So we are continuing the definition here on page 30. A certain risk or peril, a risk, the word risk in our industry, it's used with several different connotations. For example, an underwriter in a company, uh, she will say that I will not accept that risk. It has too many problems. What she's referring to is a property is being insured Okay, and then she called that as a risk. Oh, this house is very old. They have old wiring. Okay, that risk is not acceptable. It's, it's not a good risk, she would say. Okay, so she's using like a noun form to refer to that property. It can also be used as a, in, a, in a verb, like, you know, you're taking too much risk. Okay, it's a risky business as an adjective or something, okay? So the, the word risk, as we go along in chapters with the lectures, uh, you know, we'll make it more and more clear, but it just has different, different connotations. So respect of certain risk or peril, what is a peril? A peril is something that will cause a loss to happen. For example, fire, theft, vandalism windstorm, hail, water damage. Okay, there are lots of different perils. So that's a peril to which the object of insurance may be exposed. So the object of insurance in our lingo, in insurance, we are talking about what is being insured. It could be a car, home, a condo, a business, whatever is being insured is the object of insurance may be exposed. Okay, so that means you own a house, it, ha it is exposed to so many different perils. For example, a tree could fall on your house during a windstorm, a fire could start. Okay, you could have water damage, we already mentioned that. So the object of insurance may be exposed and then the definition goes on or to pay a sum of money or other things of value upon the happening of a certain event. Like I said, when you own a property, it is exposed to so many different things. So happening of an event could be, let's say, let's take, for example, you're driving your car and, you know, God forbid you got into an accident. And then now you're looking at a mess. People are injured. Okay. Or you, you own a home and, uh, you know, there's a flood or water damage, whatever it is, you're looking at a mess. An event and has an event has happened, and now you have to deal with it. Okay, so if you go, you can see this definition is so packed. So let's just reread this. Okay, so insurance is the undertaking by one person, or like a promise made by one person, the insurance company, to indemnify. That means to reimburse another person against loss or liability. Okay, we know the liability is all about lawsuits. For loss in respect of a certain risk or peril, like fire, lightning, explosion, whatever, the, it's a peril, to which the object of insurance, the, what you're insuring may be exposed or to pay a sum of money or other things of value upon the happening of a certain event. So you can see when you purchase insurance, the insurance company is making this grand promise, okay? If something happened, if it is not excluded on your policy, because you know there are several things that are not covered by insurance. We'll get to all of that when you get to different chapters, what is excluded, okay? But there are a lot of things the insurance company is promising that they will pay you for, okay? So that's a promise. Now, the, this definition contains several important insurance terms which have been underlined, indemnify the action of compensating an insured. We already said that. What is the risk? the danger or chance of financial loss occurring. Okay, so again, the word risk, later on in the chapter, they're gonna tell you it's used in different connotation. And the peril, we already said, they give in the book examples of fire, burglary, uh, wind, uh, are examples of perils. And the object of insurance, according to the book here, the item that is being insured are covered in an insurance policy, okay? so. Why I want to spend time with this is that all these could be in your exam, each one of these items, okay? So I wanted to be very clear about the definition of what this is uh, all about. And it says, additionally, the terms below are not found in the definition 
but are fundamental to undertaking insurance, okay? Um, indemnity, so we're not talking about indemnity five, but indemnity, indemnity is the contractual obligation. So they use the same word, it's a kind of a derivative uh, from indemnify, that means you're actually paying, you're indemnifying somebody, mean that you're writing a check for a loss. Insurance company is writing a check for a loss, okay, reimbursing. But the indemnity is the obligation. It's used like a noun, okay, the obligation by the insurance company to make good the losses suffered by another, the customer, by putting the insured back in the same financial position they were in at the time of the loss occurred. Okay, so basically what it is is uh, you had um, a fire in your home and so you called the insurance company and they came and they estimated the loss because you have a policy with them. You're paying the premium every month and they fixed the damage. So what they basically did, they actually brought you back to the pre-loss level. Okay, when a loss happens, you are everything is so chaotic your day's ruined, you have to call the insurance company, you know, so they're going to pay you for all of that. Even if you have to move out from your home when they do the repairs, a significant repair, and the insurance company will put you up in a hotel and they will pick up all the additional living expense, all of that. We'll get to all of that much more detailed, different chapters. But the point here is that the insurance company is making a promise when you make a claim to bring you back to the pre-loss level. Okay, so they'll pay you for everything. And then the insurer policy holder. So they're just going with this definition. This is the customer who purchased the policy from the insurance company. Insurer. So this is the insurance company. So we call them insurer. Okay. So be careful with the like insured and insurer. You should know the difference. Insured is the customer who purchased the policy who owns the home. Insurer is the company covering that providing coverage. Premium is a payment that you make monthly. Or, you know, many customers, they pay once a year using their credit card. Okay, that's called a premium. It's the sum of money paid by a person to an insurance company in exchange for an insurance policy. Okay, so what is the principle of indemnity? This is very, very important. I mean, everything is important. Okay, but uh, I'm just saying this is um, the principle that you need to know. What are the principle? So first of all, in a general uh, context, a principle is something that we live by. People say, oh, I have, my principle is different than, than yours, okay? Oh, you wanna do that? It's up to you. That is not my principle. So it is something like a moral value that we all live by, that's called a principle. So why are they using that uh, you know, uh, term in connection with indemnity? So we already know indemnity means that the insurance company is paying the customer for a loss, that is the indemnity. So what we talk about a principle, is there a principle involved there and in paying, just writing a check? Here it is. The principle of indemnity is the basic rule of insurance. It says that policyholders receive the actual amount of their loss, no more and no less. Okay, let's stop right there. What are they talking about here? What is this no more or no less? So basically, you know, you may or may not like this. There is a lot of fraudulent claim coming in. The last time I checked, I know many, many years ago, I did a seminar at the uh, Insurance Institute many years ago on the automobile fraud. Okay, the fraudulent claims within the automobile industry. Um, it was something like 800 million or something. I think today is like more than 2 billion, also property, okay? So what they are saying here is that both the customer who is making a claim and the insurance company who is paying the customer for the claim, they have to uphold a principle of indemnity. So on the customer's part, when you have a loss, just claim for what is lost. Don't inflate your claim. Okay, don't, let's say, oh, water damage. I mean, this has happened, okay? <laughs> As we go along, I'm going to give you a lot of examples. Okay, so one time, uh, a claim was made by a customer, 
and they said that we had a significant water damage in our basement and uh, everything is destroyed. So the adjuster went there to check the, you know, they're going to uh, come immediately to estimate what is lost and they're going to make a list. So when the adjuster went there, the husband and wife, they were actually stuck on the stair uh, stairs going down to the basement with the couch. Okay, so they were moving a couch and then it's just kind of stuck. And this uh, adjuster said, oh my God, you know, you guys are having a bad day. You know, you just had a water damage and now you're struggling with this couch. What happened was the little Johnny, the I think he was like eight years old. He was standing in the corner and he said, um, you know, my mom and dad were saying, let's just move this old couch from upstairs to downstairs where the water damage happened. Let's just pour water and then we can claim for a new couch. I'm sure little Johnny was grounded. <laughs> you know, no more lollipops for little Johnny, right? So, you know, kids say the darnest thing, right? So he revealed how this customer was trying to make a fraudulent claim by moving an old couch. So that's the principle of indemnity. Customers should remember always that they should, they should not try to cheat the insurance company. That's no more, right? Okay? What is this all about? No less. Okay, I'm going to just pause this just for a moment. My wife is calling. So I was saying no more means don't make a fraudulent claim and no less means that is an indication, a caution to the insurance companies. What is that all about? Because insurance companies, uh, you know, sometimes they also try to probably spend as less as possible, give the customer not exactly what they had, you know, maybe they try to buy some cheaper stuff or something. Okay, not that, you know, insurance company have done that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying, if they try to do that, okay, uh, then it's, they're not upholding the principle of indemnity. Okay, now if you have any question about these examples, whatever I'm giving you, just put in the comment if you need further uh, clarification, okay? Now, moving on to page 31, let us put everything together with an example that illustrate the definition of insurance. So here at the top of page 31, they're just going through an example. ABC Insurance Company is an insurer that earns its money through selling property and casualty insurance policies. So this company is selling home insurance, uh, condo, tenants, uh, you know, uh, car insurance, whatever it is. So that's what they're doing. The money ABC charges for each policy is known as the policy premium. It could be yearly uh, premium or it could be monthly uh, divided by 12 or whatever it is, that's called a premium. The customer has to pay the insurance company and each policy is a legal contract. Remember in the definition we said they undertake, there's an undertaking that means a legal promise they're making. So each policy is a legal contract. Therefore, ABC is contractually required to indemnify or to reimburse its policyholders if certain losses occur, okay? So the uh, Benoit family owns a home and an automobile. So they are exposed to the risk of fire or other perils damaging this property, okay? With the automobile, you can have an accident, you could hurt somebody, they could sue you. So there's a lot of problem, okay? So the Benoit uh, might also be held responsible for causing injury to a visitor to their home. That's a liability. I'll give you a quick example. So let's say in the winter time, there are a lot of people in my subdivision, they don't take the time to shovel the snow and salt the place. They are in a rush to work. So two houses from where I live, a couple of years ago, a child going to catch the school bus, she slipped and fell. And she was injured very badly. So the my neighbor was sued for, I, I, I heard that it's like almost like a $2 million uh, lawsuit. You see what happens? You have to take the time uh, to, to protect the other people because this happened in their property, right in, uh, you know, the walkway in, in, in their driveway, right? So that's what it says here. The Benoit might also be held responsible for causing injury to a visitor to their home, maybe somebody came home, they fell and they hurt themselves, you know, they could be sued or for injury someone else. 
or damaging another person's property in an automobile accident. Okay, so all that is possible, okay, that you could be causing. And so the insurance company will protect you for all of that. By purchasing an insurance policy from ABC Insurance Company, the Benoit financial responsibility for future losses is shifted to ABC. That means now this family, because they purchased the policy, they have peace of mind. Okay, so in my neighbor's case, uh, so the insurance company, they did take up the lawsuit, but the problem with that, they only had 1 million coverage. But I heard that, you know, he was sued for 2 million. So this is why my friends, if you have a policy with an automobile or property, call your broker and ask them to give you a code to make the 1 million to 2 million. Because the average lawsuit today, especially in automobile, is like 1.6 million in Ontario. The loss, the verdict for lawsuits, okay? So 1 million is not sufficient. And I have on my policy, $2 million coverage for third-party liability on my automobile as well as property. In order to make my 1 million to 2 million, to double that, I'm paying $45, not per month, per year to double the, my 1 million to 2 million, okay? 40, so call your broker and ask them for a quote and you will be surprised how cheap it is. Because when you get sued for more than 1 million, the insurance company will not pay the extra. They will only go to the maximum that you purchased, the maximum amount they purchased on your policy. Okay, most people in Ontario, they have 1 million. So my neighbor was sued for 2 million. So 1 million has to come from his pocket, from his own bank account. Imagine that. He could have just had 2 million for just for 40, for $50 a year. Okay, so as we go along, I'll just give you my, my own kind of experience and, you know, to, to help you out, okay? All right, so in the event of a loss, the compensation paid can be money or another thing of value. Uh, for example, if the Benoit kitchen is partially damaged in a fire, ABC can, uh, number one, pay them this sum of money to make their own repairs, or they can engage a contractor to repair the kitchen. You see, most companies, they prefer that they send the contractor to repair it because sometimes they give the money to the client and the, the client is spending the money in something else. You know, they go for a vacation. One of our customers went to Florida uh, for vacation and they had a big water damage and they said, oh, you know, we know the contractors, you know, just give us the money. So the insurance company gave them the money and they, they took a vacation to Florida when they came back. Uh, the mold was growing and everything. Okay, so insurance companies, sometimes they're very skeptical about paying money, but it's a possibility, okay? It is an option the customer can exercise. Now, I'm on page 32 at the bottom of page, uh, sorry, I'm on page 31. Uh, it says here, uh, 1.3, what is a registered insurance broker? That must be pretty straightforward, okay? So there are certain attributes I'm gonna list here for your exam. Number one, this person, a registered insurance broker in Ontario, is an independent insurance professional in Ontario. It's an independent insurance professional, like almost like an entrepreneur just working on, 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 on his own, okay, himself or herself, okay, independent, very important. And this person is governed by the Registered Insurance Brokers Act, which is also, in short, the RIB Act, okay? So this, uh, this person also provides independent advice to the general uh, insurance product, you know, to sell general insurance product to the public, independent advice. And also this person works with many different companies. This person doesn't work with one company, okay? So we're defining who is a registered insurance broker. Okay, so keep this in mind because there's a difference between a broker and an agent. Okay, we'll get to the agent in a moment. We are defending the broker. They are dealing with many companies. They do quotes with many companies when the customer comes to them uh, for a policy. They represent their client's best interest. Their main interest is not the insurance company they're working for. Okay, yes, it is important. They have to follow the rules of the company, but then their primary interest of the brokers is the client they are dealing with. So they want to get them the best coverage for the best price on the best terms, okay? 
And so they work with the clients more than they work with the insurance company. And like I said, insurance company, they have their own rule. Of course, the brokers have to follow, okay? So once you pass the repo level one, which you're all preparing for, and you are hired by an insurance brokerage, okay, or uh, they also call them a sponsor, right? So you got your job. You will be known as registered insurance broker. As such, you will be permitted, uh, permitted to add the designation RIB, R-A-B. Okay, this is pretty mundane stuff, okay? You can just read this on your own. Who is a um, you know registered insurance broker of Ontario? There's not nothing technical about it. After your name, you can just put uh, RIB and then O N T uh, period. You're a registered insurance broker of Ontario. Now, on the top of page 32, it says insurance brokers are different from insurance agents. Okay, it's not like like a world of difference. Okay, <laughs> they're all selling coverage, but just like a a very minor uh, difference here. The fundamental difference is that agents work for an insurance company and uh, for for an, an insurance company, that's just one insurance company and therefore only service that company's clients. A good example could be TD Insurance. So TD Insurance, usually they have call centers and um, they contact the uh, customers directly through marketing and customers call them directly and they have a whole bunch of brokers, but they all work for one company, all of them, okay? So I was there for like eight years and um, they, they called, sometimes they, you know, they're just like employees, uh, but they're all Rebo certified, okay? They have Rebo license, but they work for one company. So they, they could be called technically agents, not brokers, okay? Now, 1.4 here, next topic is what is registered insurance brokers of Ontario? So, we are talking about Rebo itself, the Rebo entity. What is it? Okay. Rebo is a self governing, self funded organization of general insurance brokers in Ontario. So, what do we mean by that? Self governing, self funded. Simply put, they're not run by the province or by the federal government. So Rebo, they run their own show. It's, it's like, it's a private entity, okay? Of course, the government will be watching them. Rebo will be reporting to the government on a regular basis, the provincial government, uh, federal government, whatever, who they report to, okay? It's not that they can just do whatever they want. They're just running on their own or something, no but then they're not being controlled or directed on a daily basis by any government authorities, okay? That's what it means. It's self-governing and self-funded organization of general insurance brokers in Ontario. It was established uh, in 1981 um, through an act of parliament under the Registered Insurance Brokers Act, which is a short rib act. Its mandate is to protect the public this is the mandate, the be all and the end all of insurance. Okay, the IBC, federal government, provincial government, regulators, uh, FESCO or FSRA, you know, all the regulators, um, Rebo, all these entities, they have one mandate to protect the public. Okay, that's that's it. So when you're dealing with the public, be very, very careful, okay? You have to do the right thing. If something is not covered on the policy, tell them. Okay, you must tell them what is not covered. Very important. You know how many brokers, they don't go through the exclusions and the customer makes a claim and then the insurance company says, oh, I'm sorry, it's an exclusion. It's not covered. Oh, I was never told. Okay, that is not covered. So as we go along, I'll be giving a lot of this advice because many brokers, they got into big trouble. Why? Because the mandate of all these regulators, entities, is the public's interest, okay? So that's the heart of the whole situation here. All right. Through the authority granted in the RIB Act, REBO regulators uh, regulate the licensing, uh, professional competence, ethical conduct, okay? 
and insurance related financial obligations of all independent general insurance brokers in Ontario. And it is also accountable to the provincial minister of finance and the superintendent of financial institutions. Although the minister of finance and the superintendent of financial institutions, they don't directly uh, run this repo because they are self-regulated, but the repo is responsible, okay? Responsible to these entities. It says here, you will learn more about repo, the RIB Act and the duties of registered insurance broker in chapter six uh, with the title, the regulation of insurance brokers. So when we get to chapter six, we're gonna say a lot more about repo and the act and everything, okay? All right, so what is general insurance? This next topic, the general insurance is like a broad term, okay? And so it's here, uh, it says here, as a registered insurance broker, you will be selling and servicing clients who require general insurance products. So general insurance involves any insurance product other than life or health insurance. So this is very key because this has been in multiple choice questions, okay? Uh, which of the following is uh, considered as general insurance? So one of the answers could be any insurance product other than life or health. Okay, that's the correct answer. Because for the life, you have to get the, you know, the life license, life insurance license, okay? I've trained, uh, you know, for many years, people who have a life license, they want to also become like a property and casualty like our industry. So the general insurance is also known as property and casualty. Okay, so they use that, those terms interchangeably, okay? So the word casualty means it's loosely translated to liability. Remember we talked about liability, always remember the examples that I'm gonna give you, okay, when they're doing the lectures. The liability, think of immediately the, the girl who was going to catch the school bus and slipped in front of my neighbor's house and how my neighbor was sued. That's a liability. Okay, so property is the, you destroy somebody's property, uh, okay, or your property was destroyed. So if you destroy somebody else's property, you're gonna be in a liability situation because they're gonna sue you or they're gonna ask for compensation. But if your own property is destroyed, then you make a claim, okay, so that's property. So our industry is known popularly as property and casualty or PNC, okay? That's what it, the meaning of the property and casualty, okay? And it's also known as, uh, it's right here. It says in the second paragraph, general insurance is also referred to as property and casualty insurance. Property insurance includes coverage for homes, condos, business assets, farms, automobiles, uh, contractors equipment, you know, the construction people's equipment, watercraft and so many other things. But the casualty insurance refers to third party liability. Okay, where a policy holder is legally responsible for having caused injury to another person or damage uh, to others' property. Exactly what we, how we defined earlier, okay? All right, so I'm moving to page 33. And this is just a very straightforward thing, the historical background of insurance, where insurance, when it started, okay? So they always refer to in all the textbooks, you will see, um, you know, this is kind of funny because in England, uh, in London, there was a huge fire. I believe most of the city of London kind of burned down and it happened in the year 1666. <laughs> you see the number 666? <laughs> so is it, they say in some connotation, the number of the, uh, the devil or something, you know, 666, right? It's not a good number really. Anyway, it happened in the year 1,666. And um, what happened was uh, most of the city, I believe uh, uh, it burned down in London. It was called the Great Fire of London. Books were written, uh, you know, about this Great Fire in London and uh, in 1666. And when many thousands of homes were destroyed, many people had to borrow money to rebuild and lenders wanted, wanted security for their loans. So what happened in England, seeing an opportunity, insurance schemes were established by economists, financiers, and other merchants. So until then, until this fire happened, and people are just running helter-skelter, not knowing what to do, 
uh, there was no insurance, okay? And so all this concept of insurance was born uh, after this great fire in London. And so basically what it is, okay, let me put it this way. When someone's home is burned down to the ground, okay, God forbid, is that person capable of rebuilding it? No, the answer is no, okay? Because they don't, they're not walking around with a million dollars in their pocket to immediately rebuild it. Then how do they do that? So they're going to be in a great loss. They don't, their life will be completely altered, right? So this is how people in England, they, you know, they had to come up with a plan to share the loss of some people who have a loss and share with, with the who, with who? Others who are living in the area. Maybe their friends, their family, or others who are living in the area. So they said, okay, let's just um, uh, put this in place, uh, this kind of sharing the loss of a few among all of us. So group, they got together. They said, okay, they started uh, what they call mutual insurance, okay, that mutually helping each other. Okay, I, I know we don't have that today. Today, it's all about making money, right? It's all called stock companies. There is no more mutual companies. But if you go back to the grassroots of you know the Canadian insurance, it's all about mutually helping each other. Meaning that, okay, we are, let's say, let's take, for example, a village or a town. So we are, let's say, a thousand people living here, okay? So each of us, we own a house, okay? So when somebody's house is burned down, okay, by fire, they have a significant damage, what we're going to do is we're going to take money from all our contribution. So let's say that from the beginning of the year, everybody will throw in a few dollars into, into a pot, okay? And they keep it there, okay? They just they uh, ask um, uh, maybe, you know, Sam Smith, hey, Sam, can you just manage this pot, okay? Just make sure that everybody puts in the money that we, did, we discussed uh, during the Christmas break. And uh, everybody will put like, uh, you know, $100 into the pot. And if somebody has a fire, water damage, whatever happened, and you just, we go and estimate it, all of us, and we help them by taking this from the pot, the money they need and giving it to them. Because you never know who else will uh, have another problem. So when something else happens, so you see the concept of insurance, this is how it was born, okay? Like sharing the losses of the few who may have a loss among the many, okay? Um, that's the... Um, it's at the top of page 33, it says here, insurance is about sharing the loss. Historically, people have pooled their resources to help others in time of need. An example from Canada's early history would be a bond raising. Okay, bond raising, a barn is burned into the ground. If a fire happened to destroy a farmer's barn, the neighbors and community would gather together to help. So they are sharing the loss of that one person among all of them. So this is the bedrock of insurance, okay? Because no one is capable of building on their own money, on their, because they don't have that much money, okay? So others have to help. So they would organize themselves in a pre-arranged uh, day to raise or rebuild the barn, okay? So they're gonna decide at a certain point, okay, we all, we are going to put this much money. Okay, so at the end of the year, they're gonna look at how many people had losses, how much was paid out. And they're going to ask the question, did we have enough money last year? If the question, the answer is no, all the things that we put together, it wasn't sufficient. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to raise the contribution of each people. You guys are putting in like $100 into the pot. Okay, this year, let's put 150 And they're going to see the same thing in the, in a, at the end of the second year, whether it was enough or not. Okay. And that's that's how insurance was uh, born. So that's the premium today. We all uh, give the premium to the insurance company. We, like, we are throwing our premium every month into the pot, which is managed by the insurance company. And when someone has a loss, they take it from the pot and they give it to that person. That that same concept in a much bigger way. We are now we have millions of people, you know, sharing the losses of other people, uh, maybe thousands of people, right? Yeah, that's how it works. Same thing. All right, so the birth of the modern day property uh, insurance can be traced uh, back to the Great Fire in London. We already talked about it. Now we're gonna to move to another important topic called the meaning of risk. 
I know we already alluded to every profession has its own industry specific terms or jargons and our <laughs> property and casualty is no exception, okay? So right off the bat, we're gonna talk about risk. So what is risk? The risk is the chance of financial loss occurring. It's a chance of financial loss occurring. That means a loss happens you never expected. We can give you so many examples. We already said fire, you never expected it. A windstorm knocked down a tree on, on your roof. You never expected it, okay? this You're driving and then you got into an accident. So from the moment you wake up, okay, until you call it a day, you are facing so many risks, driving, you know, uh, like destroying other people's property or something through your negligence, you're careless, you know, you can slip and fall, you know, all kinds of risk. So it's a chance of financial loss occurring. Generally, the uh, risk people face fall into two of uh, the following categories, okay? Risk, we have to categorize them so we can label them properly. The number one is financial risk. The second was personal risk, uh, property, and liability. Okay, the financial risk is, is the number one. Why? Because every time something goes wrong with your property, is damaged, or you have a car accident, or whatever it is, you are financially set back. Your finances immediately affected, right? So that's why the finance is the number one risk. The personal risk means uh, you get older or you lose your job, uh, you get sick, okay? All those things are personal risks, right? So we all face that. Uh, property risk, of course, we already give so many examples of owning a home and what could happen to the house, right? And the liability, we already give uh, examples of how you can be sued, okay? So the personal risk, people are um, their own greatest assets. People are their own greatest assets. Financial loss will almost always accompany the loss of one's health or life. When you get sick, when you get old, and you know you maybe you lose a job or something, you're unemployed, immediately your finance is being affected. You're off budget, you don't know what to do, you cannot pay your rent or whatever it is, okay? So that's why the financial risk is it's connected to all the other risks, okay? The property risk, we, we already uh, gave you a lot of example. For example, it says here, if someone's business is severely damaged in a fire, the financial impact is twofold. They would be faced with number one, the cost of repairing or replacing the property, and number two, the loss of business income resulting from the interruption to the business, okay? For both of these, you can go and buy insurance, okay? Uh, liability risk, of, of course, by now you're very sure about the uh, how to define liability risk. It's all about a third party. It's not about you, but it's all about your negligence. Through your carelessness, your negligence, you cause damage to others. That's a liability, and they, they're going after you, right? So when a person's negligent actions result in injury to others or damage to their property. So always remember when it comes to liability, there are two things they always say in the exam. Either you caused bodily injury or you caused property damage to others through your negligence, okay? And then you become legally liable to compensate that person that you affected. That's called liability, okay? And I know by now it must be very, very clear to you the meaning of liability. Okay, I'm on page um, 34, types of risks. So we are talking about the two major types of risks, okay? One is called the speculative risk and the other one is called the pure risk. Now, before I go to read this, I'll tell you, the speculative risk is there's a chance of either a loss occurring or a profit. I'll give you two examples. Let's say you go to the casino to gamble. You may win or you may lose. Okay, so when you lose and you're trying to make a claim to the insurance company because, you know, they gave you a policy, but then the speculative risk is 
either you win or lose. Can you imagine, does it make sense? Okay, you lost in your casino and you're making a claim. That's a chance, you know, I mean, you may win or lose. You cannot make a claim for that. Let's say you start a business and then you're not running the business properly. And for whatever reason, the business is not doing well. And then you're losing money and then you're going to make a claim. Insurance company says no. Those are called speculative risk. Always remember gambling and the business. Usually we use this in the, uh, as examples where there's a, a chance of a, occurring, a loss occurring or a profit. Okay, loss or gain. Okay, that's a speculative risk. That is not insurable. Remember that. That is not insurable. Okay. What is insurable, where you can go and purchase insurance for a pure risk. So the pure risk is there's only a chance of loss. There's no chance of gain, no chance of financial gain. That can be insured. Okay. So you're driving your car and what could happen? You could get into an accident. It's a pure risk. Okay. There's only a possibility of a loss. There's no financial gain. But in a gambling, you could win or you could lose. Okay, so remember for the exam, speculative risks are not insurable because there's a loss or a gain, okay? But where there's a purely a loss, yes, that is insurable. Now, um, the second, the next paragraph is goes to risks versus hazards. What the difference? Risk versus hazards. So a hazard is a condition that increases the risk or the amount of damage. Okay, I'll give you a quick example. Let's say your carpet is gonna ripped in your room. It's an old carpet. It's a risk, it, it's, a, it's a hazard. Okay, why? Because somebody could trip and fall. Okay, right now nothing has happened. Okay, nobody fell, but someone could trip and fall like a banana peel on the floor. It's a hazard because somebody could slip and fall. Bad wiring, okay, so that could create a fire. So those kind of things are conditions, they may lead to a loss. They're not actually like perils that'll, that are actually lead to the loss right away, like a fire, lightning. They lead to the loss immediately, but a hazard is a condition, something bad waiting to happen. So that, remember that, okay? That's a hazard. It's a condition, it says in the book here, that increases the risk of the amount of damage, okay? So there are two kinds of hazards present in every insurable risk. One is called the physical hazard, and the other one is called moral hazard, okay? So the physical hazards are everything to do with what you do. Uh, let's say you are a welder, okay? Um, or you just repair some stuff. And so you're using machinery and something could go wrong, okay? The building itself, it's an older building. Uh, the stairs are dilapidated, you know, and the things are old and they could just fall apart. They can hurt people, okay? So there's not enough lighting in the building. And the people in the, you know, in the nighttime, they come into the building, you know, they, they may slip and fall. So you can see all these things that I'm talking about, they're connected to the physical structure. Okay, those, those are physical hazards. So in the book, let's see what example they give you here. Um, let's consider a machine shop. Here, the physical hazard would include the building itself, as well as the construction, age, and condition of the building, and also what they do in the building. Okay, what kind of work they do. And it says here like welding, cutting. So these hazards increase the chance of loss uh, losses happening, like fires, injuries, and damage to products. So you can see it's very easy to understand uh, physical hazard is that the condition of a building, what they do there, you know, things could go wrong, okay? They can hurt you. But the moral hazard is a pretty tricky. Why? Because the moral hazard is a human element. This is about people, people's behavior. So when you're talking to somebody you don't know exactly whether they are telling you everything that you need to know or they are hiding something. It's very difficult to deduct moral hazard. Like let's say a customer called us about two years ago, this happened. 
from Sudbury and he said, I'm looking for coverage. We said, okay. Um, we asked a question of coverage for his home. So one of the questions was, uh, what kind of heating system that you have? What do you use for he heating? And he said, uh, I, um, I use a forced air gas furnace. So it's pretty new, right? I mean, it's been around for a while. This is the most acceptable forced air gas furnace in my basement. Okay, we set up the policy, boom. So just about six months ago, there was a loss, a significant loss in that house. Like most of the house was kind of destroyed by an explosion. Okay, so the adjuster went there and uh, they surveyed the damage as to how it happened. The customer actually was using an underground oil tank. But then, of course, the insurance company, they canceled the policy right away because he lied on the phone that he used a forced air gas, but using an underground oil tank. Also, he lied about the age of the house and everything. I don't know how the broker missed uh, some of the important information, but to cut to the chase, um, the customer, you know, he, the insurance company tried to sue this customer for lying, whatever. And he said that he called two other companies and they told them that he is using underground oil tank. And they said, no, we don't accept that. We don't want to give you a policy. And then he was talking to his neighbor and the neighbor suggested, you know, hey, why don't you just tell them that you're using, uh, don't tell them you underground oil tank, call another company and tell them that you're using forced air gas. And that's what he did. You see the moral hazard I'm talking about here? This is the problem from people. Okay, let's see what the book says here, okay, with that explanation. It says, people experiencing financial difficulty are viewed as more likely to commit insurance fraud than those who are not. People will just lie to us, okay, about their home or something. And then some people have even set fire to their own homes, right? It's a moral hazard because their financial situation is bad. Some individuals may be careless and have an indifferent attitude. They'll say, huh, I don't care. I have insurance. Why well, have to, you know, uh, fix this uh, extra security alarm system and all of those? If there's a fire or something, I just make a claim. You see, they're very indifferent, okay? So that's a moral hazard. People who are dishonest and intentionally provide false or incomplete information about the property or activity they wish to insure also present a moral hazard. So think of the underground oil tank, how he lied about it, okay? Uh, I'm on page uh, 35, the top of page 35. It says here the heading, risk as an object or activity. Remember we said we use the word risk in two or three different connotation. So the word risk is used in a variety of ways. That's what the book says here. For example, it can refer to an object or activity that is insured, meaning that an object could be a car, a home, or a condo that you own. So remember I said to you earlier, the underwriter would say to the broker, you know what, I'm not gonna accept that risk where this too old, they have old wiring or something, that risk, is not acceptable to me, okay? So that means she's using it, uh, she's referring to the object, okay? And also referred to the people or businesses who are insured, okay? So here, here's some uh, example of that, okay? Broker Jennifer is hoping to sell insurance to a construction company. So here you can see immediately that the construction company will be called as a risk, okay? Located in an industrial park, she plans to visit the risk, which is the construction company, to take photographs of the building. So here, the risk is referred to the company. Or another example, a bro broker um, Vivek specializes in selling coverage to sports liability risks. You know, people who are injured while playing sports, so he's selling that coverage, meaning that, you know, the, the, the people who are injured and doing sport, they're suing others. That's where the liability, right? So this week they can purchase coverage for that to protect themselves, okay? Such as minor hockey and baseball leagues. So you see the word risk is used uh, to refer to the object that is being insured, whether it's a liability, property, whatever it is, okay? All right. So what I'm gonna do here is that, um, I don't wanna stretch this too much, okay? I'm just gonna stop it. Um,
at page 35, the middle of page 35, then I, we're going to start maybe part two, dealing with risk, okay? How do we deal with risk? So it's a very, very important topics here, like eliminating risk, controlling risk, and retaining risk. It's a very, very important topic. I want to take my time, okay? And uh, do a, a, you know, a better job of explaining, to giving you more examples. Okay, I'm just going to stop here, and I will see you in my next video. Thanks, everyone.